Well, how many of y'all glad God's for real? He's for real. God's shown up today. You've shown up today. So for just a second, I, I just kind of want to, we just need to lift our congregation up. Now, this happens every week. It happens every week, okay? At Hillview, it happens every week. But that doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't make it any less difficult. It doesn't hurt any less. But it happens every week. In the past two weeks, we've seen 11 funerals. That's just in two weeks. And so I just want to lift up a prayer of comfort. Because we got a lot of people, man, they're heartbroken. Okay, now here's what goes on in a believer's life. We can praise God because this is truly the reality. And listen, if you don't get it, you better get it. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are risen and you go from here to forever in eternal life. That is a fact. That's just black and white fact right there. But let me tell you what. Your heart breaks because you love people. And part of what we got to do is guess what? We, we're the down here bunch left. I never worry about a believer that, that dies. That's not my worry. My hurt is for those of us that are left. Because, man, I know they're in the glorious realm of heaven, man. They, Pastor Reynolds uh, was preaching a great message yesterday, and he said something I'd never thought of in my whole life. Because, you know, Jeff's real smart, so he, he gets the smart side of God. And, and um, Pastor Jeff was looking, and he said, you know, my, my brother Steve is no longer living in faith. I never thought about it, because you and I got to live in faith, because faith is, is believing certainly things we cannot see. But he said, my brother Steve lives by sight. You ever thought of it like that? I'd never thought of it like that. That we, when we see Jesus, we no longer have to have faith. We'll be in the reality of God. We live by sight, the sight of heaven, the actuality of heaven. And so I believe this today. I believe that God exactly knew it was going to snow today. And he knew the roads were going to be icy. And he knew exactly who was going to be here in worship and when he put this message on Jamie and I's heart, he knew exactly who was going to hear it. So I asked him again this morning. I said, I'm going to preach the same thing next week so some more can hear it. Because I want you to get this message because I think this is something we lack sometimes in the kingdom of God. So before I pray, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And I want you to go find somebody. And I want, you to get, I want you to tell them this, okay? Part of learning is being a confessional church. A confessional church. So if you're a guest with us today, one of the things I'm trying to get rid of in the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the United States of America is a church that just sits and observes. And, and it's our fault as clergy because we created a system where we invited everybody to come and gather and listen to what God might do. The more I read the Word of God, and I'm, I'm working on this in writing right now, God really didn't call us to gather as much as He called us to scatter. And to scatter to all over the world and reveal who he is. In fact, Jesus' last words weren't, Therefore all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now I want you to lump up together and hear what I might do. That's not the great, commercial, great commission. He, he said, these are his last words. He said, guess what? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And now I want you to go tell people and I want you to show people and I want you to make disciples of all nations. And guess what? Some of my colleagues have forgotten this part that's really serious. And go baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you, literally it says, to the end of the era or to the end of the age. Or I'm not letting go. Here's what God's really saying there. I'm not letting go till it's finished. That's the Great Commission. I'm not letting go till it's finished. So right now it's not finished. You are risen... You're risen. We're going to talk about that today in Colossians 3. Guys, you are risen. Whether you feel like it or not. So, Senator Mike, when you walk in Frankfurt, it's probably that's a location it's easy to feel not risen pretty quick. But when you walk in, you're risen no matter what's on the table. No matter what's on the floor of the Senate, you're still risen. No matter what's going on in our personal life, we're still risen. No matter how we feel, if we're, if we're heartbroken or heart enlightened, guess what? We're still risen. So I want you to hug somebody. I want you to welcome them to this cold, warm day at Hillview. Cold on the outside, warm on the inside, okay? And, and I want you to say, guess what? You're risen even if you don't feel like it, all right? Try that out. Try that out. Hey, 
Sway, you know what I noticed? Everybody's telling everybody they're risen, but they're not getting the, if you don't feel like it, all right? Okay, let's pray together. Y'all been wonderful, man. Give yourself, hey, y'all, y'all, y'all give a praise that you showed up today. You know, I'm thankful this morning that I've been in a battle for five weeks with squirrels. I ate the wiring in my truck. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you don't need any squirrels on my property. And I praise God for that wonderful Benelli shotgun that he provided for me as a gift. And I've sent several squirrels to the glory of God here. But I was just hoping none of them had eaten my wiring harness again because I really needed my, my big old country truck this morning to get here. And, and so you know what? How many of y'all glad to know we live with a God that provides? Now tonight, there's going to be several of us who are going to be down at Salvation Army. You know why? He'll be, we're getting back to who we are. And man, I apologize that we got off track. It breaks my heart. I've had many nights with just a broken heart. That we, that at Hillview, we did the grossest thing we could become. Just a regular church. Just going to worship and hearing some music and, you know, glad-handed one another. Lord have mercy, we got 20, 127 of those units in town and then there was this wild and crazy place that said, you know what, we're going to reach the people that nobody else reached. And we got away from that for a while. We got to be honest. And we stopped saying yes and started asking what it cost or what was the liability. I never asked those questions in 91. I said, we're going to go do it and God, you protect us. And I mean, we worshiped for four years in a, in a place that the fire marshal came one time and he said, I love worship, but if it goes down with me in here, I'm going to be in severe trouble. I said, what are you going to do? He said, just pray every time you meet. And you know what? And God what? He took care of it. And so I think we need to get back to those roots. I think we might have got caught up in the lights. Might got caught up in the buildings. It's real easy to do. If the devil can't beat you, then what he does is he, he, he starts throwing systems out at you that sound good and feel good and look right, but aren't. And so, uh, man, we're going to open this church up. I mean, Scarborough, of all things, the worst thing that ever happened to us is Keith can't sing anymore, so now he thinks. And God is giving him vision and dreams left and right. He's pouring dreams into Crabtree. That's a scary thought. If y'all don't know these pastors, it's scary when they start getting dreams and visions. Here's the great news. We are finally back into God's groove. And God's groove is always, Pastor Jeff, you better be doing immeasurably more than you can do on your own. And that means we depend on God. So pray for salvation tonight at the Salvation Army. That'd be a good place for it to happen. Uh, since it's a salvation place, uh, a lot of the homeless people are going to come in tonight because it's 25 degrees and it's pretty cold under that bridge at 25. And they'll come in and let's let them meet people that love them. Not because we're nice old Christian people that have gone down to cook them a meal, but because we truly want them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's a huge difference in attitude. And, and we truly do. We truly do. How many of y'all praise God for every baptism that's ever gone on here since 1991? I do. Now, here's where I get, Timmy, here's where I even get more fired up. I thought I was going to calm down when I got old. I'm worse. I mean, I'm, wake, I'm waking up every morning just seeing all the many people that could come to Christ if we were released. This church, every one of you all, I didn't mean to keep you all up while I started preaching, but it's good for you to circulate when it's cold. Uh, how many of y'all glad you can stand up? I mean, I'm glad I can stand up. You know, and I used to think old people were silly when they said, you know, I just want to bless the Lord and save my soul and I can stand up today. Hey, I say that now. Because if you can't stand up, you're thankful for standing up. So uh, let, let's pray and just ask God to take this moment on this day, this particular Sunday. God had this Sunday already in mind. He, he had the snow already in mind. And so there's something that every one of us in this room are supposed to get because you're the ones that showed up. Okay. So he's got something that you all got to have right now. So how many of y'all willing to receive it today? All right, cool deal. About half of you, that's great. Hey, if we get 11, we can change the world, okay? Even Jesus couldn't get 100% of the humans in his leadership team to cooperate. I'm reminded of that as I lead through these years. 
Even Jesus couldn't get 100% of the humans to agree that were on his leadership team. Out of the 12, we had one that was a political bandit and another one that just kept running his mouth all the time. Y'all ever met those people? All right, let's pray. Lord, you are so real, God. And Lord, we apologize. I just want to apologize. I want to confess uh, the sin of Hillview for a period of time. Where we started looking at how little we could do instead of how great a God you were. And so, God, I pray that you take us to places that we have not been and we will be willing to go. Lord, I pray as we begin to touch this community again in a very tangible and real way, that you use all the gifts and talents, the Holy Spirit giftedness that is in this congregation, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that everybody has in this congregation, and the ability to share the gospel because you've saved us. And I pray we release that on the city. And I do pray, Lord, literally, that we become a city set on a hill. And instead of being known for just hill toppers, we'll be known as the people of the cross, the resurrection, and the light. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Love you all. Thanks for being here. Bob, thank you all for being here from Michigan. Thank you for bringing your weather with us. It's really nice of you, Bob. I really appreciate it. No, we love all of our friends from everywhere. And so I want to take you to Colossians 3, and we got to go over some, we got, I'm going to go over the first part kind of quick because I want to get to the put on part, okay? How many of you all are aware? I want to do some review. How many of you all are getting, this is a great day to do review. How many of you are beginning to understand we've spent a good eight months in preaching? It's in you. Kind of give me a head nod or something. It's in you, brother. You got it? Now, you say, Pastor Steve, why do you keep going over this? Why do you keep hounding on this? Because our brains have been programmed by the little churches we grew up in that we got to go get more after we're saved. Mike, I'm going to change your title real quick. As Pastor Mike, did you ever do that? Yeah, I did too. You know, I was just going off my background. I even read books like this that were crazy. Sandy, you remember these books as they came out? I mean, in our same era, give me more. Y'all remember those books? And you all know one of the most sickening phrases I cannot stand is you have a beautiful worship moment and there's always some brother or sister comes up to you. Well, now that was pretty good, but you just wait till the glory spout falls in this place. And it? You know, I've been following Jesus Christ since I was nine years old. I ain't seen no glory spout yet. I mean, and, and you know what that stuff is? That I've got a label for it now. It's called humanistic Christianity. Because you're still, still the center point of the deal. God bless me. God make me feel good. God give me the glory tingles. All that is is the same thing as getting a buzz. It's just getting a holy buzz. But God didn't call us to get a buzz. He didn't call us to just come to church and be what? Tingly wingly. You know, everybody leaves church. Oh, that was really good. Well, why was it good? Well, I just feel so much better. Well, whoop de doo I feel better after I eat a big giant pizza for 30 minutes. And then hell follows. You see what I'm saying? It's not about feeling good. It's about understanding who Jesus has made us. Now, if you ever release who Jesus makes you, underline this, you become unstoppable. So, Crabtree, I want to have an unstoppable church. You know my dreams. I want to go back to the early days when you and I had a lot of energy and we didn't get tired. You remember those days? They're hard to go find, but I remember those days. They were a couple decades back, and we could travel and be with churches and and, and, and I would hold court at midnight to 2 o'clock in the morning at convention, and we'd wake up the next morning at 6 and have breakfast and still have energy. I just want you to know those days are over. But better days are ahead. You know why? Because here's what the Bible tells us. When our flesh grows weak, his spirit can grow strong. So we're probably in the best spot. Uh, Pete, you're probably in the best spot spiritually you've ever been. You know why? Because you can't walk as fast as you used to. You can't think as quick as you used to. So now who do you got to depend on to see great things? God. Because you know if you're going to work eight hours, God going to have to do something. Amen? Freddie, if you're going to walk, what? 
He has to help you. He doesn't put two new knees in. Now you're going for the next 100,000. You see what I'm saying? Watch this. Here's a mystery. Can you all tell me how Freddie would be our key to Costa Rica? If anybody could stand up and give me a logical reason why Freddie Hampton would be the key point into Costa Rica, I'll give you $100 right now. <laughs> Freddie can't even speak Spanish. He speaks Kung Fu English in Costa Rica. That's what he does. Freddie thinks this is the way people understand you if you can't speak your language. If you talk like you're on a Kung Fu movie, then they'll understand you. I mean, we'll go with Freddie. He'll be leading the team. We'll turn around, and Freddie will go, we go eat now. I go, yes, Tonto. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, but watch this. Here's what's crazy. What done in Merle? It works. They understand him because guess what? Freddie's not ministering from his ability. He's, he's ministering from his given ability now i want you to dream with me today what would happen if you released what god has given you now I, I, you prosper that's a whole different question isn't it i didn't ask what can you do for the lord what wonderful little things has he given you that you can go work in his kingdom and you come back and go oh well pastor i did this i did that and i'm gonna go and what did the Lord do? Well, I did this and I did that. Can you imagine what would happen in your life if God is in it? Let's see who we are first. First of all, we're risen. Everybody got that word? Risen. Just say it with me. Risen. So you're a risen believer. All who have received Jesus Christ authentically and genuinely are risen. So that means this. We no longer live like we used to live. Yes? So go with me to Colossians 3.1. Here's what it says. Since then, because God has come into the world, because Jesus has died on the cross, because Jesus has risen from the grave, because the Holy Spirit is now inside of us as people, because God has a long-term plan, because of all that, since then, you have been risen with Christ. Now, I can preach all day on that, but that, let me see if I can compact it. You are no longer in the same location of attitude that you previously were before your conversion. What God changes in us is not our behavior. So watch this, because you can have nice behaviors and not have Jesus. You could not drink, smoke, chew, and do. Watch this, Hitler didn't drink and smoke and chew and do. Hitler did not use alcohol, did not smoke cigarettes, and did not say many cuss words. Is he saved? Now, he had a little problem, though. What he did do is exterminate millions of people to death. You think God might have a problem with that? So, but watch this. You say, well, how did Hitler get led such a stray? Because he thought his outward behavior could justify his inner nature. And without Christ, we automatically don't do the things God wants us to do. We just don't. Now, so what we do is we create a behavior code that we can accomplish. Does that make sense, Jeff? So we get a little behavior code, and because that makes me feel good. That makes me feel good because, you know, I can do it better than you can, or you could do it better than me, so we start creating these crazy things that many of you all have taught each other in Bible study that aren't true, levels of spirituality. And I know it's true because I've heard it here for almost 30 years. People go, well, I just need to get to the next level. If I could just, if, if, if I could learn to pray five more minutes a day, then the magic will happen. If I could just memorize Beth Moore's book backwards, then I would totally be spiritual. If I just knew the things of the Jewish temple, I got so tickled. Well, that makes you a rabbi. And I guess if you read on through the book, you'll see that Jesus tore that one down. So if he tore it down, I wonder how relevant it is now. Oh, but Pastor Steve, you need to know I needed something to distract me from what Jesus wanted me to do that still sounded holy. How many of you all have been distracted by things that aren't risen? But they look good, don't they, Chip? And they what? Here's why they get us conned. They make us what? How many of y'all get caught up in the feel good? How many of y'all have ever said this? Rocky, you ever said this? Well, my man, if it feels good, it's got to be of God. And I've done that. 
How many of y'all have ever said it? Well, now that's got to be the Holy Spirit because it's making me feel good. Do y'all know how many things that make you feel good that'll send you to hell there are? The list is exhaustive. Because it's, the devil figured out a long time ago, if they feel good, they'll listen to what I got to say. And God says, I don't want you to just feel good. I want to make you risen. So we rise above what we can see into what God has made us. Check this out. You ready? Since then, you've been risen. Raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. How many of y'all are glad to know we are positioned at the right hand of God? Our authority is at the right hand of God. I remember I had a woman got real mad at me. It's, I mean, there's many that have, but this lady got real mad at me. She called me and she said, I want to know who's over you. I said, God, no, I don't want to talk to him. The next person that's over you. Is it the Kentucky Baptist Convention? Well, anyway, she called the president of the Kentucky Baptist Convention to report me. And he had a funny response. He, he told her, he said, ma'am, listen, you're talking, about, you're talking about Reverend Maris. Only God is in charge of that. And, I, and she called back, and she, he said, well, she said, she said, well, I'm going to tell you something, preacher. That guy up there, that president of the KBC, they thought he had power. I mean, that's just a figurehead position. And so they, he, said, he, he, he said that only God can handle you too. I said, I told you. Now, guess why she was mad at me? I bet you can, I bet the Jeff pastors can guess because you're a pastor. Guess why she was mad, Jeff? She wanted something, and guess what the answer was? No. She wanted to do something. It didn't fit conversion, healing, development. Didn't fit the vision of this church. I said, well, we can't do that at this moment of time. We'll have to see. And so she got all in a tears because she didn't get what? And so basically what I, and she she aspired herself as this mature believer. And she didn't like me at all because I could see really I had about a two and a half year old in faith. Because as soon as she didn't get what she wanted, what? Now see, a mature believer never asked that question. So you get, I'm, I'm going to begin to show y'all what mature believers look like. Mature believers do not throw little temper tantrums over things they can't control. That's what immature believers do. Mature believers don't ask the question, what can we do? Mature believers begin to search deeply and say, God, what are you willing to do through us? What can we accomplish measurably more? Now, see, I can feed people on my own, but I can't feed people and bring them to Christ on my own. I can build a house all by myself and build a house all by myself. It'd just be a build. Well, I can't, but we could build a house, uh, you know. And, and if it's just a house, it's just a house. I mean, people build houses all the time that don't believe in Jesus Christ. But if I build a house through him, it's a house then that connects people to Jesus. That makes sense? So first thing today, operate through your spiritual position, right hand of God. Now, in a real way, we've been going through these moments, heartbreaking moments of, of death. It's been early death. We had a tragic car wreck with the Wilson family this week. We had uh, Steve Combs, great member here, been here for 20-plus years, baptized in 95 in this church. How important is that? Steve would want you to know, you better know Jesus. He was one of our great military soldiers, combat medic, healed many people through both Iraq and Afghanistan encounters, had to deal with the aftermath of that in his life. Jesus stayed strong. He died at 50. But, but he received Christ in 95, so he was good to go. Now, is every, I'm, you know, everybody in the room good to go? Good. Thanks, brother. Thanks for saying it like that. Now, if you're a maybe, you need to get saved because I'm going to help you. This is, where, this is where a bunch of mamby-pansy preachers have conned everybody. There's no maybe in believing. You either believe in Jesus Christ, you either believe your sins are forgiven, you either believe he died on the cross and he was ris risen from the grave, you either believe or you don't believe. There's not a kind of belief. Here's another lie that went out through the church everybody bought into. Well, they're just an uncommitted Christian. Yeah, that's called lost. Lost. Because what do you have to do to be saved? Receive the commitment that Christ has made. And if you receive it, like last week I told you, Fruit is going to come off the tree. You cannot hide the genuinely saved. Now, what we've gotten confused with, the religious have a tree that looks saved that never bears fruit. They are the fig leaf that Jesus taught.
You ever wonder why Jesus got so mad at that fig tree? You ever wonder, he, he cursed the tree. He didn't cuss the tree. He cursed the tree. Why did, I mean, y'all read this. I'm talking to my Sunday school teachers here. We're talking to people who've been in the Bible. Why did Jesus get so mad at that tree? What do you think, Nick? Why did he get so mad at that tree? It wasn't producing fruit. So let me help you. God's not well pleased with us when we aren't being what he made us to be. God's not pleased with you when we're not, down, when, when we're not out in this community doing what we're supposed to do. He's not pleased with us because he made us for the street. Somebody say amen. That's what he made heal you for. Now, don't be looking down the road at some fancy church. He, he put that part of the body of Christ for fancy folks. Are we the fancy folks? Look around. <laughs> but are we risen? Yes. Yeah. So it's not about being fancy. It's not about being cool. It's not about all these, i uh, got my young people here. It's not all these, these words. Hey, y'all just stay away from this stuff. It doesn't work. I mean, when I started out, Hillview, they said, man, Ayers is an unedged church. Hillview's an edge church. What is an edge church? I have never seen these terms in the Bible. I've never seen a baby boomer church. I've never seen an edge church. I've never seen a Generation X church. I've never seen a hippie church, a cowboy church, a rock and roll church. I just see church. And we got to be who we are. Now, if you reach a bunch of hippies and you get a bunch of hippies risen, it's got a hippie flavor to it. Amen? But God, it healed you. I mean, what flavor do we got here? As, as my dear mentor Leonard Sweet said, Hillview is definitely one place that's nuts. Remember? He said it right here on this stage. He looked in, and Leonard's always big on these, isn't he, isn't he Dr. Anderson? Always these acronyms. He goes, you know, and he likes to talk in that big Rochester, New York voice. And he says, well, now, Hillview, you're nuts. And your pastor's nutty. Meaning this. Never underestimate the spirit. And then he looked around our church and he goes, and this church is a big old can of mixed nuts. <laughs> yeah, we're not one kind. Now, follow me. What would happen if we really joined that? We'll never underestimate the spirit. See, when you get risen, now you never underestimate the spirit. So now, has everybody got that? Because I'm going to read real quickly in the next part. But if you didn't get that part, the next part will frustrate you. Because when you live above and when you live where you are seated, where you are seated at the right hand of God, now you've got to let go of some things and put on some things. Okay? So the part of growth, maturity, to discipleship is not, it's not just put in. It's also let go of. Because these things no longer belong to you because they're not seated at the right hand of God. You ready? Check this out. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Now, when we encounter death, where does our mind automatically go? They're in heaven. And here's why. Because we're at a moment we can't change it. Well, there's a lot of other things we can't change, but God can change. Set, set your mind on things above. On things above, not on earthly things. For you died. What you used to be is gone. Now your life is hidden what? With Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Do you all see all of this marvelous stuff? Check this out. This is so amazing if you'll embrace it. Heather, did you realize you are a part of the glory of God? That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, boom. I mean, people, if people get near you, they, they risk See, the glory of God's actually messing the mic up. They risk encountering part of the glory of God. Now, Timmy Young, can you imagine that? You dressed up and you camo, all your camo and you're looking like, you know, Yule Givens out there in the field. The glory of God's still there. Let's become that church again. Amen? Be careful. If you meet me, you're at high risk of meeting Jesus. And give him the glory. Now, what do we want to do, though, when God does something glorified in our life? Oh, we do, don't we, Nick? You know, you know how you know somebody's humble? Like if I come up to you and I say, Nick, man, you, you, you played the bass guitar incredible on that worship set. Man, that was awful. 
that's just awesome how you did that. I mean, you thumped it. I mean, you're like 79 years old, and you're still playing the bass, and I mean, it's just amazing. You know, if I gave you some compliment that I would give you. Yeah, well, you got to age, Nick. You can't stay the same age forever. And so, how would you answer that humbly if I gave you a compliment? Thank you. Those are humble people. These are spiritually arrogant people. Well, I just want you to know I give God the glory. I, I need to, the Lord needs to be recognized. I could do nothing without him. You know what people that do all that jazz, you know what they're really saying? Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. You know what humble people do? Thank you. They trust God. They know that you don't have to tell them that God poured out of their life because it was evident that God poured them out of their life. We need that church in America. We don't need one that has bumper stickers. We need one that has release of things above. Especially for the next generation. By the way, I love all the millennials. I think they're cool. Elizabeth and I raised two of our own, so we kind of like them. A lot of them aren't coming to church because the church is full of cliché and bumper stickers and slogans that never match up. Jeff, that's what makes your job hard, hard on campus. But then they meet people like you in Holly and they go, wait a minute. These people, something is in them beyond my explanation. That's called the drawing of the what? Holy Spirit. So put all those things, live in above. So when you live in beloved, let me show you what becomes natural. You can put away. How many of y'all need to put away some things? Well, let's see what we need to put away. Put to death. That's what it means. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. How many of you found that the earthly nature will not conduct itself like the heavenly nature as my dear friend ed smith told me he said man our flesh is just like an old wild dog how many of y'all have ever had a dog how many of y'all have ever owned a dog how many of y'all have ever had a good dog what what makes a what makes a dog good you're saying you all talk to me we don't have many people here today you, you won't get embarrassed huh it listens Okay, not only does it listen. Now, I've got a dog that listens. It's one of them uncommitted Christians. It hears well what I say. Old dog Max. I can say, Max, come here. He turns his head. He looks at me, verifying that he has heard the verbal command. And then he stands there and stares at me for the next five minutes and doesn't come. Now, Blake has a dog. I have a dog that... You know, you can see politically where both of our dogs stand. My dog, I supply housing, medical, food, and he sleeps in our bed. And then for his daily chore, he goes and sleeps on the couch. Now, Blake has a dog, and it's a little bit different. Blake's dog listens and follows. But it's interesting. There's two different things that happen between the dogs. Blake chastens his dog he has a little box on the dog a little holy spirit box and a collar that goes around the dog and over a period of years if he doesn't come he gets vibrated by the holy spirit and he gets a small amount of pain all you pee to people nothing that would hurt him or entice him but it allows his nature to be chasten you see when the holy spirit comes in our life the holy spirit now keeps our human nature under control so our godly nature can be released that's why it has been put to death and that's why paul said put to death because it has been put to death look at this whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality impurity lust evil desire and greed which is adultery because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, you must rid yourself of all such things as these. And I'm going to stop here today because I'm going to pick it up next week. Jeff, I thought I could do that whole piece. You said I couldn't, and I hate to admit this, especially in a public arena. I hate to ever say this. You were correct. <clears throat> I have to say that more than I want to, too. It's awful. But I love it when Jeff has to say it to me. I bask in it. I become, I become tell me more, tell me more, Jeff. How right was I? Because rarely am I. You used to walk in these ways. 
Now, here's where I want to take us. I want you to think for a moment as we come to altar, what ways this year do you need to let God dispose of so you can walk in his way? We all got ways we need to what? Put to death. Now, this is where it's going to sting just a little bit. The Proverbs said this, there are ways, there are understandings, there are thoughts that seem right to man. They seem in the human realm reasonable, but they're not God's ways. And so we need to walk in God's ways. And as we do, these things need to die in our lives, and they will. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. You ready? Anger, does it get you anywhere? Mm -mm. Rage. Makes you run blind and do stupid things. Malice, watch this. You can't love others if you're mad at somebody else. Because it's a hard issue. It's not that person. I mean, why do people get mad at stupid people? We're all stupid. You'll be mad all the time if that's your criteria. How many of y'all ever raised a child and did stupid things? Glad my father's not here this morning. <laughs> See, I knew he wasn't supposed to hear, be here today. So he might have shouted in glory. Malice. Stay out of malice. Don't try, don't try to take people out, try to bring people in. Does that make sense? Listen, this anger stuff will kill you. It's as bad as, as, bad as alcohol, drugs, or anything. It just kills people. Rage, malice. Slander. We're a nation of slander. We're a nation of slander. We just tweet what comes to our minds. That is not a good idea. Why is that not a good idea? If you all notice, I am never on social media. There's a reason for that. I know my mind, it doesn't think like everybody else's, and I blurt off at the mouth enough without having a keyboard in front of me to share everything that runs through my, my head. Only Elizabeth has been assigned to hear most of what runs through my head. Pray for her weekly, folks. Okay? We got to watch slander. And filthy language from your lips. Now, this is some filthy language. You want me to give you some filthy language? They're stupid. They can never do it. They'll never make it. I think this is filthy language. High class, middle class, low class. I think that's filthy language. Because the Bible doesn't divide people that way. The Bible says there are those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who are on the right believe and those who are on the left do not believe. There's no political connotation to that, okay? That's just the way Jesus divides them. At the right hand, customary, the right is the place of strength. That's where that came from. Why? Watch this here. I'll show you real quick. Y'all cooperate with me. How many of you are right-handed primarily? Well, okay, now watch. This doesn't mean you don't get it. This does not mean that you're not saved. It just means how many of you all are primarily left-handed? Now you understand why it talks about the right hand of God. Because that's primarily most of us are what? Now, left-handed people obviously are extremely intelligent because Blake was right-handed, and Clacy's left-handed, and there was a severe difference in intelligence. <laughs> Y'all don't tell him I said, he's not here either. That'll teach him not to show up. Check his out. Now, let, let, me just, let, me just, let me just get it right here. You ready? Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of the Creator. So next week, what we're going to take up is what is what has been put, what is available to be put on through the power of the Holy Spirit that will allow us to do ministry everywhere. Be careful. The image of its creator is everywhere. And now let's go engage the creation. Did y'all get anything today? This make it, give me a head nod or something. Did it make sense? Uh, and, 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 and I'll make it even clearer next week, so come back because let me tell you. This is what's happening again. I don't know how our bodies eat it. I don't know how our bodies are going to hold up. But, man, we're seeing dreams and visions. I'm, I'm, our leadership, I'm with our leadership. I just want you all to know we, we're, we're in partnership with another church in Costa Rica now. Pastor Warner and his family were with us. This church has got the same vision we do. they got the same heartbeat. And, and, Jim, as you and I talk, thank God they've put on the things that can make it happen. 
And they, they've got great wisdom. They've got great organization. They've got a great heart for Jesus. Check this out. They started in 2017, Tom, and they've seen 68 baptisms from 2017 July to now. I want to partner with that kind of guy. Amen? Listen, I've got churches in the state of Kentucky, and they've been up for 30 years taking up collection, preaching, singing, and they hadn't seen 68 baptisms in 38 years. And you say, well, why is that? They don't care. That's not why they come to church. They come to church because you're supposed to. They come to church because Granny went there for 50 years. They come to church to hear a little bit about God and to be seen as righteous. I hope you come to this place because you've been made righteous by the grace of God or you've snuck in to see if it works. I want to tell you, if you've snuck in today on a cold day to be saved, God is willing to save you at 25 degrees. What do you think about that? God has not changed his mind. The weather can't change God's mind. Your emotional feelings can't change God's mind. But that's pretty good, isn't it? That God's going to stay. He stays in there no matter what's happening out here. God's not shocked over President Trump's tweets. He needs to read 2 Corinthians or, or 2 Corinthians a little further about that mouth. See what I'm saying? Colossians. Don't lie. You know the number one thing that will take you away from God's reality? Lying. Be real with Christ because he's already real in you. You say, well, where is he? Waiting for you to let go. And put on what he's made you to be. Pretty amazing, isn't it, Tim? If we let go, he'll put on. Now, y'all been awesome. Some of you today need to come to Christ. Some of you today need to be baptized. Okay, next Sunday is the last Sunday of January. Not that that's a big deal other than it's the last day of January, okay? Last Sunday for this January. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, let's get that taken care of. If you've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be in your life and you know you've been saved, you know he's forgiven you of all your sins, you've been risen. Why is baptism important? You should have seen that today. Did you see that today, Miller? In other words, if I've been put to death, I've got to have something that reminds me I've been put to death. I'm going to use you as an example. Is that all right? Nobody doubts that you're a UK fan. Why is that? Exactly right. You always have your blue on. And I mean, you've had your blue on. Remember, remember that basketball? I don't want to bring things up in the past because they're crucified on the cross. But remember that season they got all those guys that were supposed to play and didn't know how to play? And they didn't, you know, it was horrible. But you know what? I, I knew that you were a fan then. You know why? You had your blue on. You said it'll get better. Now that's called faith. Baptism is putting your blue on. It's saying, Lord, I am dead to what I used to be, and I am risen to what I'm going to be. And that being under that water is it just a great way of understanding this. What was going to be is over. Now, that's why we use immersion here at Hillview, because I don't want you to think your sins got washed off. Is there a difference between washed off and dead? Now, if I just sprinkled, you know, and poured water on your head for a long time, now, you, that might irritate you, but will it kill you? No. But let's say I was baptizing. Let's say I was baptizing Sean Christ, and we get his big head under the water, and I get to chasing a rabbit in one of my stories and start telling another story, and I forget to bring him up. Do we have a problem eventually? What's the problem going to be? He did. So when you're under that water, I want you to know, no, literally, you're dead. What you once were is dead. And Justin, guess what we ought to say to that? Hallelujah, because watch this. What I once was was not fit for heaven. But when I come up out of that water, get every Sunday that we see somebody come up out of that water, guess what we're looking at? We're looking at a soul spirit that God has moved and made fit for heaven. And we've seen that over 10,000 times. Now that sounds like a lot, but that's only about three and a half days of Pentecost. Or three days worth of Pentecost. In 30 years. 
You know what's scary? If we were to just put on what God's already given us, you would see Pentecost here every Sunday. You would truly see a sweeping of God gathering his people throughout the southeast United States. Now, I don't want to see that because I want to see that. To be quite honestly, I don't want to see that, Jim. You know why? That's a lot of work. I mean, it messes you up. You've got to park in a different place. You've got to get a different seat. You know, the music changes. You've got all these crazy kids in here. They get all kinds of crazy ideas. It's just a lot easier to kind of walk it on out. Or we can say, God, I'd like to see what you see. Here's what I want to wake you up to. The fields are white unto harvest. Now, Dr. Tom, you've been into as many useless seminars through your career of pastoring as I have been to. And I never did get it because they would have seminars on how, how to find the fields. They are all around you. They're already ripe. Jesus didn't say go plant them. He didn't say go till them. He said go harvest them. And now here's where we messed up, and here's what the devil did. He said, go study them. How many farmers would make, how many farmers I got in here, people have been involved in agriculture? Okay, awesome. Farmer, can I ask you a personal question? You, you crop farm some? Look, some. Or you have it like me in your past? If you went out there to that crop and just had a study on it, could you maintain your farming ability? Eventually, you got to do what? And, at, and after it bears fruit, when it bears fruit, what needs to be done? Harvest. Now, that's where the church of Jesus Christ is lacking in America. Because we're so stinking arrogant. That's what we fight all the time. We're just like arrogant. United States of arrogant human beings is what we ought to be called. We're arrogant enough to think we can control the temperature of the planet. We think we create human life and can choose to take it or give it. See, these all stem out of the philosophy of total arrogance. We think we are equal to God. Now, once you get rid of that mess, you realize, no, I'm not equal to God, but I'm seated with God at the right hand. And so now I can operate out of God's perspective. That makes sense? So at the altar today, let's come and pray, God. May we let go of what hinders us. May we put on what you've given us so that we might see the world like you see it. Amen? All right. Now, we've we got plenty of time at the altar today. God has made an available altar. There will not be a huge crowd push for the next service. Okay? Now, there'll be a few that are now waking up, realizing that the weather was right this time. Did you notice Chris Allen's not here? The one Sunday I could have said, Chris, the miracle's among us. It did snow. <clears throat> so uh, I was really fearful this morning because Chris predicted an inch. And usually when he predicts an inch, that's 12. And when he tells us we're going to have 12, it's sunny and 65. So, uh, you know, who knows? God's good, amen? Chris and I laugh about that. He's got a tough job. How do you predict what nobody can control? And people get mad at him when he gets it wrong. I laugh at him. I said, listen, I know Chris. He is not God. I promise. He did not create the weather. Well, let's stand together. Let's stand together. If you need a relationship with Jesus, Pastor Jeff, it's a good day to get saved, isn't it? You can say, I got saved when the roads were icy. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, I, I'm truly sorry for what I've been, but I want you to make me who I can be. Lord, I receive your cross and your resurrection, man. He'll put it in you just like that. And you'll never be the same for forever. It's amazing. If you haven't been baptized, let's come and get that taken care of. Amen. Get with Jamie. Get with these other pastors here and say, hey, pastor, next Sunday I want to get my baptism done, okay? Well, let's pray. Lord, as we come to the altar pray, we pray for our city. We pray for the Salvation Army tonight, for the salvations that will take place there. Lord, we pray that you just give us life and you show us how to live as you have made us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on, church. Come on. Let's, hey, we got time to, to hang out at the altar today for a minute and pray. Let's pray and just love on Jesus.